All right. Um, amazing introduction, uh, Dr. Frostfield. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm, uh, again, the president of Wave Neuroscience. Uh, I was first introduced to this technology around 2012. And um, I'll start by making a little bit of a, a confession. Uh, and it's kind of embarrassing to talk about now, but when I first heard about this technology, I was intensely skeptical. Uh, I met Alex and several of the other scientists and doctors, and uh, we had some very provocative conversations because it was just difficult for me to wrap my head around this technology. And so I did about three years of due diligence, and I recognized that the complexity of this uh, whole process wasn't something that was easy to digest quickly. And so I've done my best to consolidate uh, all the science and data into about a 40-minute presentation. And uh, so this will walk you through a bit of my journey and um, hopefully illuminate some of the uh, evolution of um, this, this field of neuromodulation. And to give you some background context, uh, in a past life, I was a Navy flight surgeon. Uh, this picture here on the USS Boxer was taken just hours before uh, the first World Trade Center went down. And I had no idea what was about to occur in terms of the life trajectory that it changed. Uh, but obviously, I think everyone in this room was impacted by that day. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, uh, my unit was part of the surge into uh, the southern route out of Iraq. And we had the unfortunate distinction of having the first casualties of uh, the second Gulf War. And so my mission changed quite a bit. At that point, I had 200 service members where I needed to make sure that they were taken care of. Even after I left the service, uh, both the service members and their families struggled with post-traumatic stress. It was a very kinetic war. The signature injuries were traumatic brain injuries, concussions, um, post-traumatic stress. And so the subsequent uh, time in my life was sort of scouring the landscape of medical technologies, pharmaceuticals, cognitive behavioral therapy. What can we do to help this community? And I think all of these modalities have their place. Uh, they're all part of the healing journey. Um, but uh, we weren't finding great answers out there in terms of things that could really uh, be impactful. And so uh, I had left the service around 2004, finished my residency over on the East Coast. Uh, I did a combined residency at Harvard, came back to the West Coast, and was working for the Boeing company uh, as their chief physician. I took on a secondary role as their chief technology officer. Uh, many folks don't know, but every heavy manufacturing side of Boeing has a, a little ER, and uh, that's where uh, I began a lot of my career. And so as, as sort of the corporate flight surgeon, I was hearing about this technology locally in Southern California. Um, in fact, I had a pilot come to me say this really changed his life. And so I was interested, I was skeptical, uh, but I went to visit the center. I talked to Alex, who you'll hear from in just a little bit, um, but I needed to see a little bit more in terms of data uh, in terms of, of the science, but uh, the anecdotes I was hearing from people who went through the program was very compelling. And um, uh, we'll share a case study uh, in a few slides of actually one of my closest friends who tried to kill himself came in for treatment. Uh, it was kind of our Hail Mary because he had tried everything else. But this is actually uh, a commander of one of the SEAL teams. Um, and actually what prompted me to join the company was a challenge from uh, a master chief who literally put his finger in my chest and said, what do you stand for? And uh, I, I, I'm paraphrasing a bit because there are a lot of swear words. But it, it was basically, are you going to take care of snotty Boeing executives the rest of your life, or are you going to get back in the trenches and help? And so uh, while it upset me at the time, my wife said, you know, he's right. It's all you think about. It's all you talk about. And there was a point where you realize this may represent an inflection point in medicine and how we can help a very vulnerable population. So. Moving this forward, our innovation is something called MERT. It's magnetic EEG, EKG guided resonance therapy. And it's actually three separate technologies uh, being merged into a methodology uh, that's leveraging computational neuroanalytics and large database of EEGs or brain maps. Uh, these are some of our business partners and our research partners. And one of the things that I wanted to immediately uh, bring into the company is very robust academic research. And so we've been very blessed to be able to work with uh, some of these groups, um, just working from the 12 o'clock position around. Rancho Los Amigos is one of the largest NIH-funded Alzheimer's research centers in the country. Uh, we're working in collaboration with the USC Center for Neurorestoration, the Division of Neurosurgery. Um, we're, we've got several studies ongoing there uh, that are both through the IRB stage and in the data collection stage. 
uh, the Department of Defense that you see on the bottom. Um, it's a bit of a long story, but several of the patients who went through our program or were in our pilot study went back to their commands, talked about the technology. The command surgeon from SOCOM, Special Operations Command, came out to visit. Uh, he said, I'm going to send you five of our cases. If you can have one of them, we're going to do a trial to help you out because we don't have any technologies that are really working for concussion. And we were very fortunate that five out of five benefited from the treatment. And so we do have an FDA grade trial going through uh, the, the stages of data collection right now. Um, and I'll share a little bit about that experience as well. Uh, Colonel and Job is the preeminent sports group in Southern California. They take care of the Lakers, Dodgers, Angels, and Rams. What's interesting for both the Colonel and Job experience and the SOCOM experience, uh, as I met the brass at SOCOM and uh, met some of the doctors at Colonel and Job, uh, there was a lot of gratitude helping the people who were out in the field and were injured. But there's a quick pivot towards what can we do for human performance? What can you do to optimize our people to make them better on target? They call it the prehabilitation. And this was not a space we were comfortable with, to be honest, because um, you know, the, in medicine, it's about saving lives and stamping out disease. We weren't really used to optimizing performance. So this is a space that we've had to get comfortable with. Um, and it's definitely an area that the market has been very interested in what we're doing. So I'll share some of that data with you as well. And so our process is a bit of a paradigm shift. And this took a while for me to wrap my head around is the current paradigm and what many of us the system we grew up with is the DSM-4, DSM-5 criteria. There's clusters of symptoms. We categorize patients into a diagnostic group, and then we try to use best-in-class modalities to get them to a healthier state. We're looking at things through a slightly different lens, and we're now using neuroimaging to identify areas of the brain that aren't functioning well, groups of neurons that may be misfiring, and how we might work to get those to fire more coherently. And so you'll hear these terms quite a bit. We talk about phase lag coherence, alpha coherence, um, and ultimately getting uh, the brain to work more efficiently as an engine. 2% of your body weight, 20% of your caloric burn. It's a very thirsty organ. And when it works more efficiently, uh, there's more reserve, we find, to work in different ways. And one of the metrics that's been of greatest interest to us uh, was heart rate variability. We're seeing significant improvements in heart rate variability. Um, so our process is three steps. I mentioned this briefly. Our first step is to get an EEG. Uh, many people... Uh, call this a brain map. It's a very old technology. It's been around for uh, almost 100 years, uh, but it was in analog form. It's now in digital form. It got digitized in about 2009. And that allows us to perform many sophisticated discriminant analyses and algorithms to look at the brain in ways we haven't been able to uh, previously. So that's our first step, and we'll take a deep dive into EEG. But we're looking at 28 different biometric data points and running that through a normative database then designing algorithms unique to each individual. And so here you see the treatment modality is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It was FDA approved in 2009 for the treatment of depression. And it's a figure eight coil. It's about a 1.5 Tesla MRI grade magnet. And when I first heard magnet, that's part of what threw me off. Uh, it, it seemed a little bit snake oily, as Dr. Brosfield mentioned. But the first order principles of physics that it's borrowing from are magnets are one of the few things that can deliver energy, create an evoked potential through a solid object. So we have a one centimeter piece of skull that would get in the way of something you place on the surface. But using a magnetic coil, you're able to deliver energy across the skull and create evoked potentials and stimulate the brain. And so this is something we call the biosovereign law, where you're able to create a field effect and stimulate a group of neurons with some degree of precision. We've not had that capability until very recently. And at a high level, what I liked about this, um, even as I was learning about it, is that it was non-pharmaceutical, number one. Um, number two was that it was non-invasive. It didn't require any anesthesia, no needles, no scalpels. Um, doesn't even need conscious sedation. And it's a similar exposure to a standard MRI. And most of us don't worry about sending a patient to an MRI. Um, that kind of exposure isn't known to be very harmful. And there's some good safety data out there as well, which we'll share. But moreover, as I talked to specialists in this area, neurosurgeons, neurologists, um, I was speaking to everyone that I could find on the subject, uh, this is a new discipline that's starting to emerge. And so, uh, so much of our armamentarium currently is dealing with psychopharma and chemistry. Uh, there's surgical you know, ablation technologies we can do, but neurophysics is something that's new that we're just starting to 
learn more about. And it's, it's kind of this new emerging field. And I realize there should be a fourth area on here of lifestyle medicine. Um, and uh, I will fix this slide uh, for the next presentation. But I want to touch briefly on this whole emerging area of neuromodulation. Uh, because we're not the only uh, show on the road. I, I think that we're doing something fairly unique, but I want there to be an understanding as everyone leaves here today uh, of what this field is about. And ultimately, this is a class of technologies and therapeutics that are striving to restore function to both central and peripheral nervous system. And it comes in two main classes. There's invasive or surgical neuromodulation, and there's non-invasive, non-surgical neuromodulation. And what we're doing is totally non-surgical and non-invasive. But I'd like to touch briefly on the surgical piece because it lays down a lot of the scientific underpinnings that we borrow from. And so this is a brief video. It's, it's a TED talk by Andre Solzano. He's a neurosurgeon who practices out of Canada. But he's talking about the innovation of the surgery called deep brain stimulation. And so I'm just going to let that play, and then we'll pick up. About 100,000 patients in the world have received deep brain stimulation. And I'm going to show you some examples of using deep brain stimulation to treat disorders of movement, disorders of mood, and disorders of cognition. So this looks something like this when it's in the brain. You see the electrode going through the skull into the brain and resting there. And we can place this really anywhere in the brain. I tell my friends that no neuron is safe from a neurosurgeon because we can really reach just about anywhere in the brain quite safely now. Now, the first example I'm going to show you is a patient with Parkinson's disease. And this lady has Parkinson's disease, and she has these electrodes in her brain. And I'm going to show you what she's like when the electrodes are turned off, and she has her Parkinson's symptoms, and then we're going to turn it on. So this looks something like this. So the electrodes are turning off now, and you can see that she has tremor. Can you touch, can you try to touch my finger? Can you touch my finger? Can you touch my finger? Can you touch my we're now going to turn it on. It's on. I just turned it on. And this works like that, instantly. And the difference between shaking in this way and not <laughs> the difference between shaking in this way and not is related to the misbehavior of 25,000 neurons in her subthalamic nucleus. So we now know how to find these troublemakers and tell them, gentlemen, that's enough. We want you to stop doing that. And we do that with electricity. So we use electricity to dictate how they fire, and we try to block their misbehavior using electricity. So in this case, we are suppressing the activity of abnormal neurons. We started using this technique in other problems. I'm going to tell you about a fascinating problem that we encountered, a case of dystonia. So dystonia is a, is a disorder affecting children. It's a genetic disorder, and it involves a twisting motion. And these children get progressively more and more twisting until they can't breathe, until they get sores, urinary infections, and they die. So back in 1997, I was asked to see this young boy, perfectly normal. He has this genetic form of dystonia. There are eight children in the family. Five of them have dystonia. So here he is. This boy is nine years old perfectly normal until the age six, and then he started twisting his body. First, the right foot, then the left foot, then the right arm, then the left arm, then the trunk, and then by the time he arrived, within the course of one or two years, the disease onset, he could no longer walk, he could no longer stand, he was crippled, and indeed the natural progression as this gets worse is for them to become progressively twisted, progressively disabled, and many of these children do not survive. So he is one of five kids. The only way he could get around was crawling on his belly like this. He did not respond to any drugs. We did not know what to do with this boy. We did not know what operation to do, where to go in the brain. But on the basis of our results in Parkinson's disease, we reasoned, why don't we try to suppress the same area in the brain that we suppress in Parkinson's disease, and let's see what happens. So here he was. We operated on him, hoping that he would get better. We did not know. So here he is now, back in Israel, where he lives, three months after the procedure, and here he is. <laughs> On the basis of this result, this is now a procedure that's done throughout the world, and there have been hundreds of children that have been helped with this kind of surgery. This boy's now in university uh, and leads quite a normal 
life. This has been one of the most satisfying cases that I've ever done in my entire career to restore movement and walking to this kind of trial. Pretty amazing, right? And so as I was learning about this procedure, and to be clear, this is not what we do, but it opened my eyes to the innovation and the potential, and I started leaning forward thinking uh, of what would be possible. And so as I spoke to people who are conducting this procedure, and it may not be well known, but there's a, a total subspecialty in neurosurgery now that's called functional neurosurgery of people who are doing this procedure and, and variants of it. Uh, what was interesting is that when you walk through the evolution of this space, this procedure actually turned neuroscience on its head, so to speak. Um, because in the 70s and 80s, you, rem you may recall so much excitement being generated by the discovery of neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine. And as we engineered new molecules to replace deficient levels, the pharmaceuticals weren't having the type of phenotypic changes we were hoping for. And it's not to diminish, I'm not an anti-pharma person up here saying that they're, they're evil. I think that they definitely have their place in the armamentarium. But when you look at the types of changes that are possible with this procedure, it answered this question of the chicken or the egg, that if you can have small changes in the electrical architecture of the brain, you can have these sweeping changes that change the downrange chemistry. And so it was an important procedure in terms of laying down a lot of the science that we borrow from. And as I talked to more and more specialists in this area, there was a realization that not a lot of people were willing to get the procedure. And if you think about your own loved ones, if somebody was suffering from Parkinson's or uh, depression, this is also uh, cleared for obsessive compulsive disorder, they have to be pretty severe before you would agree to have a parent or a spouse have a hole drilled through their skull and a live electrical wire placed in the brain. It's just a daunting ask. And so there was this proverbial race for a non-invasive technology. And the first iteration of this is something called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS. This has been FDA approved since 2008, and the data on this is roughly 40% of people will have remission of treatment-resistant depression, which is exciting. The commercial tale is that if 60% of your patients fail and go back out into the community and are not having a good response, this, this doesn't really catch on as well as it otherwise might. And so the group that we're working with now, uh, with MERT, what we found is that if we personalize that treatment, that base technology, RTMS, to the individual, we might be able to touch a wider range of disorders. And it's interesting talking to the people who innovated this technology, it was not specific to one diagnosis. They weren't chasing a diagnosis per se. They're just trying to help this organ, the brain, function better. They're trying to improve the performance of the organ. And because of that, it's able to touch many different conditions. And I want to be clear, it's not necessarily disease modifying. They're not saying it's a cure for any of these things, but at least in my experience with veterans, it's taking them off the ledge. It's giving them more emotional reserve to deal with stress and to deal with uh, different problems in life. And so that can be quite meaningful for a lot of vulnerable populations. Um, just to talk about some of the data that's out there, the most authoritative third-party review I could find was by this group, CPAC. It's a comparative effectiveness Effectiveness Public Advisory Council. And this actual, this assessment was adopted by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And that 40% of the time that RTMS works, they found the magnitude of effect for depression was larger than cognitive behavioral therapy and drugs combined. So number one, is it effective? I think this answered the question that yes, it, it can be effective. And is it safe? The second question, uh, there is a consensus statement from the American College of Psychiatrists and Neurologists that found even at doses higher than what we would typically use at a human, this was found to be fairly safe. Not perfectly safe. I'm going to walk through some of the side effects and adverse events. But uh, this gave uh, us some reassurance that we weren't causing undue harm to patients. And, you know, the first principle of medicine, primum non nocere, first do no harm. Uh, we can feel pretty good that if the side effects are temporary discomfort of the scalp, Headaches, that can be alleviated by over-the-counter ibuprofen or Tylenol. And then the most significant risk that we like to share is the risk of seizure. Um, and it's more of a hypothetical risk. I'm going to knock on wood when I say this. We haven't had an episode of seizure in our clinics because we're actually a sub-threshold technology. But to benchmark that number, 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 500,000, 
the Nintendo Game Boys our, our grandkids and kids play with, the brochures list a risk of seizure one in 4,000. So it's, it is safe, but since 2011, safety protocols have been implemented that makes this a much safer technology when a lot of this data was gathered. So now let's talk about EEG a little bit. Uh, this threw me off too. When they told me this cutting edge technology incorporated EEG, uh, I was fairly unimpressed because when we went through medical school, this is an old technology. Uh, there's nothing really new or cutting edge about it. Uh, but as I mentioned, the digitization of this really made a difference. And Alice will talk about it a bit. We now have dry lead EEGs. These are wet lead EEGs um, that take about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, we now have the capability of capturing this in about 15 minutes using dry leads, which is really a quantum leap in technology. What I didn't understand about this is it's a functional study versus MRIs and CT scans, which are considered the gold standard of neuroimaging. They're still images. They're snapshots in time that are giving you very rich information about anatomy. So if you're looking for a tumor, if you're looking for a bleed, if you're looking for anatomic derangement, it's the perfect tool. If you're looking for function, the EEG is giving you better information because it's taken over a time domain. And so this is giving you an idea of, it's an electrical picture of the brain, much like the EKG is an electrical picture of the heart, the two electrical organs in your body. And how that ends up looking for us is, we've learned that everyone has a unique signature. Right? And so we have this dominant frequency that our brain is most comfortable living at. You tend to be born with it. And there's no perfect brain. I know a lot of people come in really curious, do I have a perfect brain? And you know, there are some that may be better than others, but this is it's kind of honors our biodiversity that no two brains are really identical. Um, but we have, uh, uh, as Dr. Brasfield mentioned, we have an operating rhythm that we're most comfortable at, somewhere between 8 and 12 hertz, sometimes 8 to 13 hertz. Uh, so whereas you might be an 11.4 hertz brain, I might be an 8.5 hertz brain, and somebody else may be 10.3. It doesn't matter, it's just where we live. It turns out whether it's through physical trauma, such as a blast injury or a car accident, the chemical trauma of, let's say, substance abuse for years, or the emotional trauma of having a loved one die, there are areas of the brain that may fall out of synchrony with that dominant wavelength. And these waveform patterns start to emerge, and you start seeing these consistently. And so this pattern you see here, where the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is cycling, let's just say at two hertz. That information mismatch is gonna cause somebody to feel lethargic, not wanting to get out of bed, lack motivation, because this is the executive function area of the brain. Right, and so the geographic location of the abnormality and the frequency mismatch inform us quite a bit about the, how the individual is experiencing the world. So let's think of a different scenario where uh, the visual cortex, the right occipital parietal lobe, let's just say hypothetically that's cycling at 30 hertz. Now you're scanning your environment 30 times per second, but the executive function area of your brain, which may be healthy, is cycling 10 times per second. And so the information overload may cause that person to experience anxiety, profound anxiety. And it's also not unusual to have two or three different areas of the brain that are not functioning well. And so many of us experience from day to day that uh, you may be depressed at one moment, anxious later in the day, and where that changes from just normal life experience into pathology, we tend to look at people who have more than two standard deviation abnormality. Um, so we can start to characterize these conditions based on the waveform patterns that we see. And that brings us back to these two technologies. RTMS, um, we've learned, or at least as I was doing my due diligence, I learned is a one-size-fits-all protocol. It's one location of the brain, the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, at one frequency, 10 hertz. Some manufacturers will have a secret sauce, they'll say 9.8 hertz. Uh, but really, it, it's just one frequency, one location. And if you were to reverse engineer this, that's the right frequency in the right location for depression. You're gonna see about 40% of your population respond to the treatment. And what our group of doctors, engineers, and scientists asked is what if we geonavigate to any area of the brain that's not functioning well? And what if we personalize it to that individual specific frequency? What would those results look like? And it turns out that makes a really big difference. And what our neurosurgeons shared is, um, you know, after you look at this after the fact, it, it's kind of, and of course that would work better. But if you are a size 12 shoe, one, there's two analogies that I hear quite often. If you're a size 12 shoe and you walk in a shoe store and they jam you into a size 10 shoe, you're not gonna be happy. It may not work for you. And one of our ne other neurosurgeons who is a great musician says if the brain is a symphony of, it's actually uh, over five billion neurons, but let's just say it's 200 instruments. 
but your strings are a half beat off. Let's say they're at 8.2 hertz while the rest of your brain is at 12. That music, that symphony is gonna sound like white noise. But if you give that group of neurons just a gentle nudge back to the frequency it wants to be at, you have music again. And that's really, it's an oversimplification of the brain, but that's functionally what we're trying to achieve. And so uh, let me run through some of the data real quick, and I'm getting a signal that we're uh, approaching uh, the limit of our time. But we ran a pilot study where we got 86 veterans with moderate to severe post-traumatic stress. And in phase one, we gave half the group real treatment and then half the group sham treatment. And this is kind of the gold standard of medical trials. We measured the VA's preferred metric for symptom severity of post-traumatic stress, the PCLM. And then at stage two, everyone got treatment. And we'll explain why in a moment. And so here you see a graph where in phase one, it was double blind. The line in blue you see is placebo group, and the line in red you see is treatment group. And the placebo group, even if you, we were to give somebody a sugar pill, uh, we expect to see about a 15% change, and that's what we saw here, about an 18% change. The treatment group saw about a 40% change, which is very significant. And so the team at the midway point ethically decided we can't withhold treatment from the placebo group, so everyone got treatment in stage two, and by the end of the four weeks, we saw about a 60% improvement in symptoms, which is very significant. And the other data point that I found compelling was that nobody got worse. And so when we talk about medication management, even certain types of talk therapy, there may be a subset that doesn't respond well. Um, and we certainly have a group of non-responders. This patient here didn't have a great response. Others had very large magnitude of effect. Um, but overall, a 60% change in symptoms over the four weeks, also corroborated by EEG imaging. And this was a piece that really kind of woke me up to the technology. And this was a veteran that I knew. Um, he was an Army Delta who was struck on the side of the helmet by a round. The helmet did its job, it stopped the bullet. But the back face deformation of the helmet caused a significant traumatic brain injury. And so you, you see here a group of neurons that's firing about two to three standard deviations above normal. Hypervigilant, was getting in fights all the time. Uh, road rage, carried a weapon with him, had a knife under his pillow, and after four weeks of treatment said that he was feeling better, wasn't having the road rage, got rid of his weapons, uh, at least those in the car and under his pillow. And um, I was doing quite a bit better. The other data point that I found really intriguing was that people were sleeping better. And uh, I think this group probably understands better than most that sleep is foundational to so many causes of morbidity and mortality downrange. And uh, this is a longer talk, but um, there's so much data coming out now about the importance of sleep fundamentally for just about every condition. And if you were to list the top five or 10 causes of morbidity and mortality in the US, um, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, cognitive decline, insulin resistance, if you could give somebody one prescription to change a lot of that, all of that, sleep would be foundational, right? Diet, exercise, all these things are important. Um, I think sleep is one of those really fundamentally important things. And I was not expecting to see this in the data set, but that we were seeing statistically significant differences in people who were getting the real treatment was very compelling to me. And so we're gonna follow this up with in-lab polysomnograms. Uh, we have had a few people get pre and post treatment polysomnograms, and we're able to see people getting more deep sleep, stage three, stage four sleep, and more REM sleep. And that were, I don't know if people are familiar with this, discovered the glymphatic system that is clearing uh, beta amyloid and tau protein uh, during those deep stages of sleep. Um, but that gets me excited about the potential of um, what we can do for people from an overall wellness and quality of life perspective. So at this point, I decided to send in my first patient. I mentioned I was skeptical. It took me about two years to send in a patient. This was one of my closest friends. He is the guy who uh, tried to take his own life. He's consented to me sharing his story. Uh, great guy. Um, and when we deployed together, he was a rock star Marine, meritoriously promoted twice. And, um, but he witnessed his friend dying in the accident and really had a downward spiral. And this picture was about 12 years later. Like a good Marine, he followed all the instructions the VA gave him, went to every therapy you could imagine. He had stellate ganglion blocks or needles in the neck. Um, was taking 20 different medications, antidepressants, pain medications. He had a failed back surgery and a pseudoarthrosis. Um, was really struggling. And uh, I told him, I don't know if this will work, but let's give it a try, because one of our other friends had already been in for treatment. And to my amazement, this picture was taken about three weeks after treatment. 
Um, I just couldn't believe it. And it was different because I knew he wasn't lying to me. He was a friend. Uh, his wife came into the clinic in tears, hugged Alex, hugged everyone, said, you gave me my husband back. This is the man I married 10 years ago. And it, it, it kind of blew me away. Um, so I decided I was going to spend more time here, learn a bit more about it. And one of the trends I was seeing is a consistent pattern of veterans who are saying, uh, my anxiety is reduced. I don't need to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol anymore. And that was interesting to me. These were anecdotes. But I realized that a lot of these issues were not an issue of willpower or suck it up or determination. It's just an intelligent response to your environment. If you're feeling profound anxiety, you're doing what you need to do to survive so that you can be a good husband or a good wife, be present for the kids. And if that means self-medicating with a cocktail at night or taking a medication your doctor prescribes to you, that's what you do. And so um, this gentleman at the top now works for the company and is one of our SCAR employees. I asked the group to go back and look at the data and ask questions. And what we saw, number one, just about everyone was sleeping better. But number two, there are reductions in pain scores. And we don't know if that's uh, fixing misfiring or misprocessing a pain signal or whether that's just the restorative properties of sleep. It probably doesn't matter. What matters is that people are having reduced perception of pain. And what kind of blew me away was that people were coming off their opioids voluntarily. And anybody who's in the space knows that takes almost an act of God. You take a Vicodin away from somebody, they want to claw your eyeballs out. And so at this point, I was still at the Boeing company. And I asked Alex and the group, do you guys know what this means? And, um, and we ran a little bit, uh, we ran a pilot later on through the Boeing company. And before I got there, though, I, I kind of wanted to understand it because it defied my traditional medical training. I just had a hard time wrapping my head around that. What I learned is in animal models, with this treatment, you see about a 3 to 5x increase in dopamine that gives patients a soft landing if they stair-step their way down from the medication, which is what my friend Jeff did. When he told me he was off his medication, I said, you need to go back on because you're going to have withdrawals. And he told me that he was already off and he didn't have any of the shakes or sweats that you would typically experience. And so this sort of lined up for me that as an outpatient, if you can detox somebody, this would be quite meaningful. But I want to understand some of the root cause and mechanisms and how the brain was involved in this. And so there is some very good research out there now that's showing the brain is a fundamental bad actor in people's upregulation of pain, what we call hyperalgesia. And you can even superimpose genomic studies on this, where you can find people who are predisposed to develop chronic pain, people who are even predisposed to develop substance abuse to specific substances like uh, marijuana, THC, um, opioids, cocaine. Uh, so there's, there's very good science out there now. And the area that seems to be implicated is this one you see on uh, the left-hand uh, functional MRI image. That area is the reward center of the brain, called the anterior cingulate gyrus. And anytime something good happens in your life, whether you win the lottery, your kid ho comes home with straight A's, or your team wins the Super Bowl, that area is going to light up. There's a big surge of dopamine, and you have a feeling of euphoria. And many addictionologists would argue um, the external stimulus, whether it's cocaine, methamphetamine, or opioid, doesn't matter. It's actually this dopamine surge that the, that the individual is chasing. So I want you to remember that this area of the brain, it'll be relevant in about five or six slides. Um, what was interesting to me as it relates to this opioid epidemic, and I could have thrown 100 different studies up here, but this particular one caught my attention. It's with a long-acting opioid called methadone, where a year after stopping the drug, people's brain remained rewired. That area of the brain was still overactive. And so well-intentioned doctors um, helping people with pain, these long-acting opioids, I don't know if we fully understood the kind of impact it would have on our patients, the durability of effect a year after stopping treatment. That's fairly profound. And uh, you know, I didn't tell Alex I was doing this, but being the skeptic that I was, I wanted some internal validation that what my friend Jeff was telling me. And so I asked him if I could look at his EEG image, and he indulged me. Um, and to my amazement, uh, it was that area of the brain, that anterior cingulate gyrus, that was three standard deviations above normal. And so this was a bit of an aha moment for me that, uh, again, as I mentioned, this was not an issue of willpower for him. He had an organic issue with his brain that was undermining his effort. And we know from Betty Ford data, 70 to 80% of people who go through inpatient detox will have recidivism within a year. 
I don't think it's because they lack the desire to stay sober. I think it's because there are areas of the brain that are causing them to reach for those pills. And what can we do if we can address that area? Because he's now three years sober. You know, he beat the odds and he's doing great. In fact, he's now getting his MBA at University of Oregon. And I talked to him yesterday, he agreed to let me share this, but he, he, he made me say, go Ducks. So, uh, <laughs> so go Ducks. Um, so this experience when I was at Boeing prompted me to uh, do a little pilot. And we ran uh, nine workers compensation patients through this, all with very severe opioid dependence. And this was better than the veteran data. Six out of nine of them became sober after two months. The three out of nine were at a safer, lower dose. And so to give you a data point, anything above 100 morphine equivalents of drug will double your risk of all-cause mortality in any given year. And so even though the remaining three were not sober, and they had real pathology, they had uh, horrible osteoarthritis and uh, pinched nerves, and so they got to a lower, safer dose, but were not completely abstinent. But what really impressed me is that they went back to work, many of these patients who are on total disability. And if you're in this space, you can become very jaded and very skeptical that they're gaming the system. And for me, uh, the mea culpa was, no, these people just needed a chance. Like, nobody wants to be disabled. People, and this lady came back in holding her first paycheck say, saying, this is getting my dignity back. Right? So uh, I think as we're able to address some of these root cause issues, we're enabling a lot of people to have profound changes in their quality of life, uh, self-esteem, uh, and in, in at least this one case, her dignity. And so we are in the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. I, I think the market is looking for anything that can help in this area. Um, but as I took a step back and looked at this, really what we're looking at is the evolution of precision medicine. And we're seeing this in a lot of our oncological fields. We're getting better, more precise drugs. But with this technology, and especially the database that we're gathering, we're getting smarter about how we can treat people. Every patient that we treat is allowing us to have a larger database with which to be more precise in how we're treating people. And so that may be the part that I'm most excited about, is that we're seeing these good changes now, but I think that we're going to get better and better as time goes on. One of the areas that we've gotten better at is using the heart. You know, I mentioned we've got these two electrical organs. It was interesting in patients who had profound head injury, and I'll show you a video of a gentleman who had a gunshot wound to the brain and lost a big chunk of his cortex. Um, the EEG isn't enough. Like, we have a very hard time extrapolating where somebody's brain was pre-injury. And the heart gives us a guidepost. Right? So there, there is a harmonic between the brain and the heart that allows us tri to triangulate when the EEG is not enough. And so this is not our imaging. Uh, this is actually the National Institute of Health uh, that showed us this. And so I'll play a brief video. This was one of the five cases that the SOCOM command surgeon sent us. Um, you can just hit play real quick. So this is uh, an Army special operator. He got uh, shot through and through gunshot to the brain, lots about a... Uh, 57 millimeter portion of his motor cortex. Spent a year at Stanford Medical Center in the Palo Alto VA, was told, uh, unfortunately, he would probably never be able to walk again. His first day, he told us, damn it, I'm walking again. Ignore the damages. We did everything we could to support him. Yeah, it's a really strong. So you can see his peripheral nervous system was fine. He didn't sustain any injuries. This was all brain. Oh, nice. I feel this way. All right. <laughs> this, is, this is wonderful. That's cool. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Oh, oh, oh shh. Oh, oh my god, this is, a, this is a no trivia. Sleep good tonight. Oh, alright. Woo, look wow. at that. Put somebody's face in. Yes, you can get Oh, yeah, look at that. All right. Oh, yeah. That's nice. This is a, this is a really nice. You couldn't do that this morning. No. Oh, oh wow, so tight. <laughs> <laughs> and the legs move. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. All right. And so I like to share with people that our contribution to this was very small. Um, it really took a village to help him. He had a great rehab team, an amazing family, 
and most importantly, he was a fiercely determined individual. Oh, that was pretty good. Yeah. And so that suspension system is a safety device. It's not holding him up. It just catches him if he falls. And these are his first steps. And just to be clear, we're not doing anything to regenerate neurons. Uh, the neurons that were lost are lost. Uh, but what we're trying to do is to recruit the neurons and create new neural pathways uh, to engage the residual motor function that remained. And um, he's now able to ambulate on his own. So we'll see um, a bit of video here. And I know I'm short on time. So can we go to the next slide? And um, you'll see he gave us this gift earlier in the year that he's now able to walk about 100 feet on his own. Wow. And you can imagine from a quality of life perspective, going from a situation where his spouse or a caretaker would have to lift him and carry him to the bathroom <laughs> to now being able to go and get a beer out of the fridge for himself. Um, this was really meaningful. His goal now is to run a marathon uh, in the next five years. And, uh, well, it, it seems like that would be impossible. I, I don't want to put anything past him. So, um, so yeah, really an amazing story. So true to this philosophy is we're trying to treat uh, the whole brain. We took neuropsych batteries on many of our patients, and we see uh, trends kind of across the board. So the open circles are pretreatment. The closed circles are post-treatment. And people, you can see, tend to feel better about themselves. They're interacting better with people around them. They're less impulsive. We're not taking somebody from you know, an IQ of 70 to genius, nothing like that. But uh, I think what we're trying to do is give people the best versions of themselves. And uh, we see this as a fairly consistent pattern. The other thing, for anybody who's in the human performance space, uh, we didn't recognize that these things were happening until we got these computerized neuropsych batteries. Um, but we were seeing changes in reaction times. Uh, we've had a few golfers tell us that their golf game improved, their tennis game improved. It's interesting. I don't fully understand all the mechanisms. I need people who are smarter than me in this space to tell us why that's happening. Um, these devices that we mentioned earlier, the Wolf devices, I'm wearing one too. That company actually called us out of the blue and said, what are you doing for HRV? We haven't seen these kind of changes before. And what's interesting is, uh, in this case, you saw about a 30% change. Typically, with very intense training, you might be able to achieve an 8 to 10% change. So these kind of changes were fairly remarkable. It's not across the board. Not everyone experiences this kind of change. But HRV is supposed to be a proxy for emotional resilience. So we're pretty excited uh, seeing that data point. We weren't necessarily expecting that. And this is a quote that's kind of poking fun at myself. I, I mentioned that I was very skeptical. I uh, mocked them for a period of time. And now I say I, I'm, I'm their biggest cheerleader. Um, so we're embarking upon the path of very rigorous, robust academic study. Uh, we want this to be third-party trials. We have our own internal data, uh, but we've learned, um, well, not us, but the market has told us that uh, third-party data is always more meaningful and powerful. So Special Operations Command and Uniformed Service at the University are doing a study. Uh, we had a bill make its way through VA and Congress, and uh, we're pretty excited about that. It made it unanimously um, through Congress. I'm going to bypass the video just in the interest of time because I've got about a minute left. Um, one thing I do want to mention, uh, we've been very selective about who we'll work with. And we're not growing for the sake of growth. We're very deliberate about who we'll partner with. We're sensitive to our reputation. And that's why working with this group here was a very deliberate decision. And so um, you know, Dr. Brosfield, we met with her, uh, blew us away, very impressed. And this whole philosophy. Uh, Dr. Bredesen, I think everyone knows him, preeminent researcher, thought leader in the Alzheimer's space. Um, for that uh, kind of collaboration for patients to have access to that, I think, is very meaningful. And so uh, we're trying to work with uh, really good thought leaders in the space. Uh, we have a great group of advisors and consultants. Um, Dr. Liu at USC is um, helping us to nurture the technology in the right ways. And um, we've had some very good consultation along the way. And at a high level, um, we're seeing a lot of promising data on this. I should mention on the SOCOM study, we're blinded to the data, so I, I can't share that right now. But we just went through a futility analysis, which is a green light, red light type of thing that the FDA conducts. And we were advised we have a green light. And the people who are unblinded to the study suggested that we open it a couple new sites. So we're going to be opening at Camp Lejeune 
potentially Camp Pendleton in the next year with the idea that we need the throughput to get to the endpoint faster. So uh, although we're blinded, we're encouraged by the feedback that we got. Um, again, non-invasive, non-pharmaceutical. It can be done on an outpatient basis. Um, and the quality of life factors, this is hard. Science doesn't do a good job of quantifying this. But uh, for example, my friend going from being suicidal to coaching his kid's football team and being an engaged father and pursuing his education, uh, one of our other patients going back to work, being able to uh, get a paycheck again. These are the kind of things that keep us very inspired and motivated to keep working. And so we're very honored to expand uh, the group of people who are taking this technology out to the community. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're going to be here later for questions.